So before we begin a short question, uh, how many of you are like, uh, see on your teams, there is a virtual hand. You can raise your hand. So I want to know how many of you are working in startups, for example, or working in a small team, small projects. How many, how many of you in that? So a couple of you. Okay. What about the rest of you? I am assuming that others you are working in big companies or large projects. So typically, you know, one of the what do you call myths is that if you are a startup, if you are working on a small project, architecture is not needed because there is an expectation that anyway your software is going to be simple. You are developing something simple. Maybe there are only two, three people on the dev team. So with such a small team, it is kind of inferred that the complexity is also limited. So the question would be, do we need architecture for a simple project like that? Or if you are in a startup or if you are doing a hobby project, do you need do we need architecture for that so that would be the first question and uh, i don't know what is your experience so those of you who raised your hand what is your experience in your startup or in your project how many people are there do you have a dedicated architect so i just want to put out this question anyone wants to give an opinion there are no right or wrong answers whatever yeah go ahead sai in my team, I'm working alone, so I am okay. technically the architect of my team. I okay. don't know if I need an architecture to the extent of spending, say, weeks on planning and, and thinking about the architecture. Yeah. I have some broad guidelines and broad rules of thumb which I use to plan my stuff. But okay. the, once it's done, documenting all that and converting that into a more robust design is the need that I have experienced. And yeah. it's not always possible to do it, but I do it whenever I can. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, interesting inputs that you have given. Yes, uh, there is some sort of an architecture, but you don't want to spend weeks developing it. And secondly, documenting the architecture, that is also important. Anyone else wants to give their inputs? Yes, somebody raise. Sudhakar, go ahead. Um, hey, Arvind, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, architecture, See, uh, architecture is definitely needed. Whether you design it or it's already designed and you just go with what is out there, it's still, no, it doesn't matter, right? But without architecture, it's basically you're trying to build a structure without the structural design of sorts, right? Whether mm -hmm. you take off the, of uh, whatever, who someone has designed it already, you take it versus you do it from scratch for weeks together, it doesn't matter, but any software would need an architecture, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a couple of things from Sudhakar's comment. Yes, architecture is there, whether you have done it explicitly. If you have not, not done it, you are straight away developing your code, writing your code, designing some modules. Uh, in those decisions, there is implicitly an architecture which develops. But is that the right approach? We have to see. Uh, but yes, Sudhakar's input is very valuable. Radha Krishnan, go ahead. I think uh, mo a lot of well, what I did observe is a lot of those software systems today um, that I was exposed to during earlier periods, um, most all of them have migrated to a cloud based sort of. Mm -hmm. So I think um, one of the most important things is to understand the concept of cloud because okay. previously, a, a long time ago, this sort of thing did not exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was more like, um, let's say, cl cloud as a concept, SAS or PAS or IAS or whatever, I mean, infrastructure yeah. services, all these things did not exist. And now, virtually all of those, those systems that existed before technically are now cloud. So, yeah. um, uh, I think uh, um, being an architect is a very niche thing. Let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I mean, um, not just a personal example. I've heard that, I mean, being an architect is a full time thing. Firstly, if you're an architect, so let's say you're a software architect, you're actually a full time software yeah. architect. You just do architecture. You see, correct, and you get paid, paid a hell of a lot of money for it. It's a very, dem it's a very demanding. So, thing. yes, uh, 
in the ideal so, case right. so um, what, what well, I mean, what I what I know is like, let's say you're a Java architect, and I, I mean, like a full-time Java architect, and you do it like full-time, and it's okay, you're okay. in demand because it's a very niche skill set as a, as an software architect. If I'm not wrong. You know. Yes, yes, you are correct. Niche, so niche, I will like, uh, talk a little bit okay. more in depth about sure, that sure. Little, little later. So let's move on. Uh, so uh, to give you a definition of architecture. Uh, Let's go back to the article which is published here. See, any kind of software you take, it has some structure to it. So what is architecture? Basically, it defines that structure. Uh, how, what are the components? Because the co software has many uh, components. So what are the main components? How, how these components interact with uh, each other? And then how the system as a whole interacts with the environment. So that basically, is really the architecture of the system. So it's kind of a high level uh, bird's eye view of what the system uh, composition is. But uh, apart from the structure, because Sudhakar also used the word structure. So apart from the structure that architecture defines, it is really about capturing the decisions. Because given a problem statement, right? So a customer comes and says, this is what I want you guys to build. So that is the problem statement, sort of the requirements that we call in engineering lingo. So those requirements come to us and then we have uh, many ways to go about uh, dealing with these requirements. So it is not obvious that there is one particular architecture that was that would fulfill those requirements. You can there might be three or four very good architectural solutions to that particular problem statement. So architecture or the process of architecting is really about capturing the decisions. So it's not just putting it on, on paper that this is the structure, these are the components, these are the interfaces. That is only part of it. The real uh, important thing about architecture is capturing those decisions and explaining to people why you took those decisions. So to give you a little bit more concrete examples, suppose you are designing a web application. Some uh, architect might have decided I'm going to use NoSQL for certain reasons, and he would explain these are the reasons why I selected NoSQL. Or for that matter, he has selected MySQL. So again, he has to explain what is the rationale? Why has he selected MySQL? Now, sometimes these rationals uh, is not necessarily technical. Right. Sometimes it might be industry driven. Sometimes it might be driven by the kind of uh, skills that are available within the company. So there could be a host of non-technical reasons as well. So to give you an example, I work in the telecom domain space where you know uh, you build two main components in 5G. One is the radio access network, and then the other is the 5G core network. So many players in the industry, when they build the 5G core network, typically the language that is used for core network is Go. So it, they don't use Java or .NET or uh, you know C++. The primary language used for building 5G core networks is Go. Most people use that. So if I am building a 5G core and from scratch and I am asked to write the architecture, one of the decisions that might be taken is, uh, you know, we will do it in Go because it's a lot easier to hire talent. Because they have, so the talent will not only have the relevant coding experience, but they will also have the domain knowledge. So obviously I want to hire people in the telecom domain. So I can't hire a Go expert and then ask him to learn telecom stuff. That is uh, much harder. Uh, you know, harder task. So the easiest route for me to form a team or for the management to form a team is to hire Go developers who are in the telecom space. And that we know from the industry that they are widely available, easily available. So the point I want to make here is sometimes these kind of decisions that an architect takes are not uh, technically driven. They are non-technical. Uh, so non-technical aspects also have to be considered. So what is the input for uh, architects? Already I uh, mentioned it in passing. So the input is mainly the requirements. Now these requirements come 
typically from the customer, you might call them as business requirements. And one of the things that an architect does is to understand the business requirements, translate them uh, partially or fully into engineering requirements. Uh, and from there only, the, uh, you know, so that that translation is also part of what an architect does. And then as part of architecture, he will produce various artifacts. So these artifacts could be Word documents, Excel files. So let's not, uh, I mean, some people are, are uh, misled thinking that architecture is just a single document. It's not like that. It could be a Word document which has a bunch of, which has everything in it. That's fine, but it need not be a single document. It can be, uh, you know, some things are better as a spreadsheet or it could be a bunch of diagrams created in Visio or any other tool. So architecture is a bunch of these things and it could in, in fact, uh, so, but one of the main art artifacts is what we call as an architectural model. So I will talk a little bit more about that later. Now requirements can both be functional as well as non-functional. So functional, obviously we know, you know, if this under this, these scenarios, this is what the software is supposed to do. So if a user comes, he should be, he or she should be able to log in, change password, reset password. And then for uh, these are the privileges for a user login. And these are the pages, the layout of the pages, the functionality of the pages and so on. Whereas the non-functional requirements would be things like performance, scalability, maintainability, and so on. So here, this non-functional aspect is what has evolved quite a bit in recent times. So just now, uh, Radha Krishnan gave an input that, you know, earlier architecture had a certain flavor to it, but these days things are moving to the cloud. So naturally, when software is moving to the cloud, the architectural aspects also have to evolve. And this is where architecture has changed drastically in recent times, because an architect, architect need not, would not just look at the functional aspects and performance aspects in isolation, but he or she has to look at a lot of things, how it will scale with the load. What is the maintainability? And because we are talking about cloud software or even for that matter, cloud native software, architects have to consider a whole lot of new things, Kubernetes, Docker, security of containers, and uh, deployability, CI, CD. How quickly can you roll out a change from uh, you know design right up to production? And uh, observability, one of the important things when you are deploying any kind of a cloud-based uh, software, uh, because things can go wrong in so many ways and debugging a production software is not trivial. So observability, that is one of the key things that an architect has to do. So now, see when you are uh, in this new world of microservices or cloud-based architecture, the nature of a the kind of things that our architect needs to look at also has changed. So it's not just functional aspects, non-functional aspects as well, but they also include runtime things like uh, what I just discussed. So when we talk about architect, what are the decisions an architect makes? The whole uh, bunch of things. It can be selecting a particular pattern, or a platform or a programming language or a database, third party libraries, tools, and many more. So these are so many, I mean, everything depends on the context. It's not that an architect has to do all of these. Uh, and uh, there is no hard and fast, fast rule that architect has to do all of these. So to give you an example, suppose you have a team of very inexperienced developers. Let's say most of them are freshers. Obviously, they can't be expected to do uh, a lot of design work or any kind of work related to architecture. So in that kind of a project, an architect takes on a bigger role, right? But if you have a team which has a lot of experienced developers, then the architect gives a very high level view. He will lay down some of the important decisions. Then he will leave it to the developers or the, yeah, he will leave it to the experienced developers to fill in the details. So what the experienced developers don't want or they don't like is micromanagement. 
they don't want every decision to be taken by the architect so an architect has to realize this so the, he has to work with the team and uh, you know uh, according to the context experience of the team he has to he or she she has to you know fine tune his responsibilities and the responsibilities of the developers around him so this is a like high level introduction to what architecture is so one of the questions that always comes up when we talk about architecture is what is the difference between software architecture and software design so some uh, you might have already got a hint of the answer so architecture is about high level abstractions whereas design is about the low level implementation details so an architect would give these high level like abstractions but the developers would be the ones who will fill in these details so to give you an example what kind of details are we talking about so the design software design would be talking about class methods properties data structures algorithms writing the actual code or the business logic so these are the things which developers would do so architects may not bother with these things so they may define what are the kind of classes that i mean depends really uh, like i said depends on the level of uh, expertise within the team but an architect might uh, come up with class diagrams inherent inheritance hierarchies and so on but beyond that he may leave it to the developers to fill in the methods properties exact data structures that you want to use and so on so this is kind of a high level view of what uh, how architecture is different from uh, you know software design but this difference is not clear cut because we talked about let's say high level abstractions but what is exactly high level so the like uh, the software engineering community doesn't agree on what is high level nobody agrees what is high level right there is no precise definition what is high level or what is important and but what has emerged over time is that what is important or high level is very much contextual so to give you an example of what this contextual means is that suppose in your project api gateway is a very important uh, module right so then what would happen it's perfectly possible that you have in your team somebody called api architect some of you might have heard this term api architect because api gateway in your system is such an important component maybe all the interactions go through the api gateway it is a very critical part of the entire system and a lot of high level decisions have to be take, taken at that uh, for that component so in that context it makes sense to have an api architect who will lay down exactly how the api should be designed and to, to give you an idea what what kind of decisions this guy will take he will look at how the api should evolve or for example should the uh, data schema should it uh, like related to database let's say should the schema be fixed or should the schema be uh, allowed to change over time so and api gateway when you look at apis how should we do versioning should we do migrations should we do versioning and how should one api be related to the previous version of the api should there be for example backward compatibility how do you achieve this backward compatibility so these are some of the things which a api architect will consider but in a different project where api gateway is not so important okay then you don't even need a api architect so there the architect will not make that kind of decisions that we talked about related to apis he will leave it to the designers or developers so this is the kind of context we are talking about which decides what is high level and what is important but what has become clear in many of the discussions uh, in literature is that a good architect identifies these things correctly what is high level or what is important for that project and he does it at the very start of the project because typically whatever the architect decides you know those decisions are not easily uh, reversible you are kind of stuck with those decisions for the rest of the project 
So for example, if the architect decides I am going to use MySQL for this project, you are stuck with the decision for the rest of the project. But as more, uh, but a better architect, he may say, OK, I will ask you to use MySQL, but we will also use an ORM like Hibernate. So that in future, we should be able to replace MySQL with some other database because we have a ORM in between, which will mediate the interactions between the database and the application. So an architect makes that kind of decisions as well. Right? So the, one of the interesting things which was pointed out by Martin Fowler, some of you may know Martin Fowler, the founder of uh, ThoughtWorks. So one of the things he said about architecture is, architecture is about reducing irreversibility. Because whatever an architect decides, that is kind of fixed for the rest of the project, for the life cycle of the project. But an architect who is smart, who is doing his job well, he tries to reduce this irreversibility. So what he does, he identifies what parts of the software are fixed, what parts can be changed, and then he attempts to minimize the former. That means it should be the number of things which are fixed in the art architecture should be as few as possible. So a perfect example of this is what I gave you just now. You can fix the database MySQL, but a better architecture would be to say MySQL is a variable. Instead, I will have Hibernate in between, which will allow us to move to a different database in future if so required. Right, so these are kind of the decisions that an architect takes. And ultimately, architecture is really a shared understanding of the system design. So this is where one of the gentlemen earlier commented. He, he has kind of done some architecture for his system, although he is the lone developer. He has selected something. He has the idea of the architecture. But then how does he communicate this architecture to somebody else? How does this? So he used the term documentation. That is what it is all about. So architecture is not just fixing a structure, but how do you communicate the structure? How do you communicate your decisions and the rationale behind those decisions to the wider team? Because nothing is worse than giving uh, developers the architecture and ask, asking them to go and start the coding. So uh, developers who don't understand why an architecture was designed in a certain way will not do a good job implementing it. So developers have to understand why a certain component was selected and uh, you know what were the alternatives, why those alternatives were rejected. So that kind of an understanding must be there with the developers, with the entire team for that matter, not just developers, but even testers. So the yeah, we were talking about the difference between architecture and design and uh, you know, in literature, this comment has been made. Architecture is design, but not all design is architectural. So architecture is also a design activity because when you are selecting, when you are comparing alternatives, you are actually making design choices. Right. And uh, one more person, one more uh, expert commented, a soft, software systems architecture is the set of principal design decisions made about the system. So what we call principle is the same thing that we called here high level or important. Right? Basically, it comes down to that. So this is a high level view of what is design and what is uh, architect architecture. So to give you uh, an example uh, or an analogy. In Bangalore, I take uh, you know the public buses quite a lot. And the other day I was thinking about uh, you know, the architecture. And the design of. Uh, the two main actors in the bus. So who are the two main actors in the bus who are like managing the uh, operations of the bus? One is the bus driver and one is the conductor. So these are the two main actors. Uh, or let's say human actors who manage the operations uh, in, within the bus. So an architect would do this. He would identify two major components. One is the bus driver and one is the bus conductor. And why has he uh, you know, may, uh, come up with these two components? Because 
it's very obvious that these two components have very well defined roles uh, so the uh, and he also defines how these two uh, components will interact internally so for that the architect says the method of communication will be either vocal that means the conductor will shout something to the driver or it will be through a tool a tool such as a whistle so whistle is a tool or you can say interface in in software terms and uh, the roles of each of these uh, components is very well defined the concern of the bus driver is to look externally so he looks at the uh, inputs coming from outside the system that means he looks at the road he looks at the traffic lights he looks at the other vehicles coming in between and the pedestrians so his concern is mainly interfacing to the external world whereas the concern of the bus conductor is to interface with people coming into the system so mainly his interface is about the data coming into the system people getting into the bus his job is to issue tickets and then you know make sure people get off at the right stops and so on so the roles of the conductor and the bus driver are very well defined how they interact with the outside world is also defined how they talk to each other is defined because the interface has been defined as a whistle so these are the kind of decisions which an architect will take now what uh, what is the role of a designer now developer see the architect does not define what is the he has defined the interface as the whistle between conductor and bus driver but he doesn't define what are the messages so a short whistle will mean something two short whistles will mean something a long whistle will mean something else so these are the different messages which are used to communicate between the driver and the bus conductor so who defines these messages not the architect it is the designer or developer who defines it so similarly you know there could be other decisions which the designer will take so i just wanted to give this analogy to give you some sense what are high level decisions what we call as high level abstractions and what are low level implementation de details which the architect normally doesn't bother with and gives you know designers the freedom to make those decisions so earlier you know uh, somebody commented you know uh, i don't want to spend weeks making a design or some uh, making an architecture or something like that so there is this uh, uh, kind of notion that you know architects are like sitting are special entities special people sitting in their ivory towers and doing an architecture for weeks and once it is done they hand it down to the developers who will go and implement it in code but actually that is not how it is supposed to be so one of the things an architect is supposed to do is that he has he is supposed to talk to the developers talk to testers talk to customers and other parties other stakeholders like business stakeholders so architect has multiple uh, interfaces he he has to be a very much not just a technical person but also a very people oriented person he has to have very good negotiation skills interpersonal skills so uh, like radha krishnan said uh, he is some kind of a like i don't know special breed or some some term he used so yes architect brings together a lot of uh, important uh, abilities so that is why you don't have a lot of uh, successful architects out there not all developers become successful architects and there are reasons which i will go into later but uh, yes uh, so architects are, should not work in isolation they should always be interacting with the team try to understand developers perspective testers perspective and then fine tune the architecture to suit all those uh, requirements so it's not just the business requirements but he she should also consider the kind of team that are in place what are their skills what are their like requirements and consider those as well in while coming up with the architecture because what would happen otherwise he after spending weeks designing an architecture that architecture goes to the developers and they have no clue how to implement it or the architecture is so complex they can't implement it right 
there are unnecessary uh, cost overruns delays and so on so that is something we should avoid and can be easily avoided if the architect from the outset talks to everybody talks to all the stakeholders in the system so at this point i think i'll give a pause uh, we'll have some q and a before we go to the second part where i'll talk about how uh, i'll give some examples from software some architectural patterns and then we look at how developers can move to the role of architects so before that any questions or comments for that matter yeah radha krishnan go ahead i think one of the things uh, that i did find and i found it very repetitive um, is uh, well as a business analyst of course or well, when i work as a business analyst or a project lead or whatever uh, one doesn't really get involved in development as such. so the project specific development can get done by developers either they outsource or within the team or whatever. so one thing i did find is the logging standards the standards of logging like when you when you have logs right for to catch up exceptions or whatever is appalling i mean when you have a log you literally can't make anything out of the log i mean let's say there's there's some issue and something code dumps or a process fails which sometimes may happen then uh, the immediate thing is to then fetch the log and send it to some repo analysis which is what every build does but a lot of times when you read the log it's very difficult to make out what's what because it's so like it's just like a garbage dump you know a dump of things this looks very large and sort of you know sometimes it's even so disorganized you can't make anything out of it and typically let's say at the end of the day okay, um, a log arrives at somebody's plate mm, i don't think i mean i've rarely found a case when somebody makes some useful sense out of it. okay okay so i got right. your point uh, so just to mm -hmm. summarize yes logging is an important thing which uh, yeah. architects may not define the contents of the log or the format or the structure but at least mm -hmm. he would provide some guideline that logging has to be done in a centralized way all logs should go and you he may even decide you know in a java application you have to use log4j with a particular adapter in place so those kind of decisions an architect may take but the exact format of the logs that something the developers may you know have a meeting and decide the exact I mean, as format of, of the logs and so on yeah what i feel is as a first step first is to make it a little bit more readable let's see even if you can make it a little bit more like readable Uh, I mean, formatting the log and the type of error messages, uh, classifying the type of error messages, whether it's an OS level thing or or whatever, whatever. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And then that's a different thing. But 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 you know, most the, the the basic logs. I mean, let's say you talk about a treasury address system, which I did, which I worked, which which of course I worked on, three or four. The logs are so complicated. I mean, um, when I read the logs, sometimes like. you know at the end of the day something happens let's say uh, something code dumps a process you know most of these things like you know they have servers and events going through there you know let's say a server goes yeah, down I, yeah because of short of time uh, we can't yeah, 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 the, the details what 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 i did found is that the basic problem before deciding on the structure or the classification the, the first thing is to make it a little bit more readable if you if it's not readable in the first step then you know like formatting and all that comes later Okay. Right. Okay. Right. That's what I. Anyone else about. has any question or comment? We can take that as well. Then we'll move on. I'll mute myself. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what are the different patterns of uh, that are available in architecture? There are plenty of them. So here in this. i have shown two examples so this is on the right hand side you have a typical uh, very common pattern which is there on the web which is the client server architectural pattern so the software is concentrated at the server and of course client has some responsibilities so client will make a request server will do some processing maybe access certain backend systems databases whatever it may be 
and give a response back to the client. And uh, of course, you will have multiple clients uh, that can concurrently access you know, the services from the server. So this is a typical client server architecture. Now, if you think about this architecture, you can imagine, you know, scalability. Uh, what you should consider at the client side, what you should consider at the server side, security, portability. So when it comes to portability, what you should consider at the client side, what should be at the server side. So uh, to give an example, uh, the client code should be able to run on any browser, on any OS, on any kind of device, whether it's a tablet or a PC or a mobile, whether it's Android or iOS, right? Different uh, aspect ratios, different form factors of the devices. So all that should be considered with respect to portability on the client side. But portability is not such a big issue on the server side because you are in total control. You know exactly. Uh, you have you you can uh, pick and choose the kind of server on which you you wish to deploy this application. But then multiple clients are accessing this app, so reliability and scalability become important issues on the server side, right? And then let's say clients, each client is having a different version of the software. So then interoperability with the latest version on the server, that becomes a concern. So when an architect decides on a client server architecture, he will consider all these quality attributes. So quality attributes would be scalability, maintainability, durability, reliability, you know, I don't know, backward compatibility. Uh, so many things are there, performance. So, so all these have to be considered. On the left side, there is a completely different architecture. So this is uh, what we call as a pipeline architecture, where data enters from the left, and then it goes through a series of processes. And each, you know, each module along this pipeline does something very specific. So this is the architecture of a compiler. So text or basically source code enters from the left, and then each component does something specific. Lexicon analysis, syntax is analyzed, and then semantic analysis, optimization, code generation. Right? So this is where you have the executable code for a particular architecture, whether it's ARM-based architecture or x86 architecture. So this is the code that will actually execute on a particular architecture. And this is the pipeline architecture. Now, similar architecture is there in the cloud as well, right? Your data enters, let's say you are talking about IoT data. Data enters at a particular uh, point within the cloud. So AWS will have lots of services. So one of those services processes IoT data coming in. Then from there, it goes to another uh, thing, maybe DynamoDB or something else, or it goes into Kafka. From Kafka, it goes into some real-time streaming analytics, right? So this pipeline architecture is now nowadays very common uh, in the cloud because uh, you take a data-oriented view of the architecture, how your data comes in, what, how it is transformed, and how it goes out of the system. So uh, you know, IoT kind of applications, any kind of application where Real-time streaming and analytics is important. You know, this is the kind of architecture which people follow. So this is just two examples, but if you look at the literature, there are plenty of uh, architectural patterns out there. I think I have listed here some of them. So this table gives kind of a high-level summary. And uh, like here, there are like dozens of architectural styles which have been grouped into certain categories. So if you are talking about a distributed system, client server, peer to peer, shared nothing architecture, um, broker. Broker is uh, like, uh, I think Kafka is like a broker kind of an architecture. Rest. Everyone, all of us are familiar with the uh, REST APIs. So REST is an architectural style by itself, service-oriented. 
because this uh, table is an old table, the new forms are not listed here. What are the new forms? Microservices architecture, serverless architecture. So they also can be part of the distributed system. Messaging, right? Event driven architecture, asynchronous messaging, publish, subscribe. These are the messaging kind of uh, systems. Then structural. So layered architecture. Suppose you take up, uh, talk about uh, Java E2E, right? So that is a layered architecture. They have a access layer, they have a database layer, they have a business logic layer. Uh, or if you talk about MVC architecture, that would also come under the structural category. So component based pipes and filters, monolithic, then adaptable systems, micro kernel, reflection, plugins. So these are architect. Uh, so uh, what it means is that there are some architectures where the core part of the system is very small. That's why they call it micro kernel. And anything you want from the architecture, you have to add it as an extra uh, as a plugin. Or so the architecture in in a certain sense is self configurable. It is extendable according to the requirements of the application. So some architectures are designed like that to be adaptable from the outset. Then you have a shared memory architectures and so on, right? Uh, so these are the different architectures which are out there. And uh, I spoke about some of them, gave some examples. Then there are also frameworks. And uh, one of the useful places to look at uh, architectural frameworks is to look at this particular uh, web page from ISO. So ISO, as you know, is a international standard organization which standardizes many aspects uh, of uh, networking as well as software. Now, typically their concern for a long time, the concern of architectural standards was mainly on hardware. So uh, uh, historically, people did not give so much importance towards standardizing software architectures. The concern was really to standardize hardware architectures. But uh, then towards uh, middle of uh, the 1990s, just as the World Wide Web was getting more and more popular, uh, and uh, software systems became more and more complex, then the realization grew that we need proper uh, standards for defining software architectures. And from those uh, you know, early uh, efforts of standardization, frameworks also arose. So I also has kind of collated, uh, you know, different architectural stand, uh, frameworks which are out there. A framework is like a template from which you can, an architect can quickly design an architecture. So an architect doesn't have to start the, like the process from scratch. And typically these frameworks are very much domain driven. Every domain has its own uh, framework, which kind of, codifies the best practices or the available tools which are at the moment current in that domain. So anyone who is designing or it could also be platform driven. Suppose you are designing uh, an architecture based on Hibernate. So Hibernate will have a recommended uh, what they call is a reference architecture. So then or for that matter uh, Java Spring Boot. Spring Boot will have a reference architecture. So if you are adopting Spring Boot for your uh, project, you are implicitly adopting that architecture. So that reference architecture automatically comes into your project. But you have to make some choices because the reference architecture will have, uh, will be kind of open. Like not everything is set in stone. So then when you adopt it for your project, you have to take some decisions. OK, in Spring Boot, there are like 12 different things I can do. So I will fix a certain some things I will fix, some things I will keep them open, which you know designers can you know have the freedom to choose. So here in this uh, web page, some some of those frameworks are given. Like Air Force has its own uh, enterprise architectural framework. 
IoT, there is a framework for IoT, which is kind of standardized by IEEE. And the framework for management systems. And enterprise frameworks are there. Frameworks specific to the automotive sector. Right. So now, uh, you know, if you are designing some sort of vehicle, uh, some sort of vehicle management system, you might start your work from this. You don't have to start from scratch. And this may also be important for later certification because some of these uh, softwares, they have very stringent certification requirements before they can be deployed in vehicles. And those certifications may want, uh, may, may actually mandate that you follow a certain architectural framework. So, you know, some of the decisions sometimes are, you know, kind of driven by the certification requirements or regulatory requirements. Big data, there is a framework for that. Right. So, so many frameworks are out there. And, uh, you know, this is a useful page. Uh, it doesn't mean that one of these architectures will be fit for purpose for your work, but uh, you know, uh, the, uh, it is at least uh, better to be aware of what is out there. Service oriented modeling framework and so on. So, so many things are out here. So you can take a look at that. So coming to, uh, so that, that is about patterns and uh, architectural frameworks. And we are, I also mentioned in passing that every domain tries to give some sort of a domain specific reference architecture. Now, when I say domain, uh, it could be like IoT or aerospace or automotive. So those are the domains which we are talking about. But it calls it can also be very much platform specific. So instead of say domain specific, you can replace this with platform specific. So what do I mean by platform specific? What I mean is, let's say you have adopted ARM as your platform. So specifically for ARM, there will be a reference architecture. How do you use an ARM architecture and create a SOC around that? So you might, uh, uh, so th there will be a, sp a specific set of guidelines for you to do that. Or x86 architecture. So I am coming from the, uh, like, so that is platform specific or if you want to make uh, look at uh, look at a software example then i would say something like spring boot right so that is a framework or in the case of uh, aid google google app engine so when you adopt google app engine to build your app then it it will specify a certain reference architecture how you should use the app engine how you should integrate it with other Component uh, parts of the Google Cloud ecosystem and so on. So selecting a platform also means that uh, you are kind of implicitly selecting, or uh, or you have to look at the reference architecture that comes with that particular platform. Okay. Now the exact artifacts that an architect produces, as I described earlier, is an architectural model. So it's not just uh, capturing a structure, but it captures the architectural decisions that have been uh, taken for that particular for coming up with that architecture. Now the model itself can be very informal. It's just a bunch of slides or diagrams. Or it can be semi formal. So you use a language like UML unified modeling language. So using that you can uh, create different types of diagrams. So it can be a state diagram. It can be a use case diagram. It can be a class hierarchy diagram and so on. So different diagrams are available as part of UML. So that is a semi formal approach or you can take the formal approach. So for formal modeling, there is a uh, there are languages which help you do this. So they are called ADLs, architecture description languages. So they can be used for formal modeling uh, and uh, documenting the architecture. So once it is the, the beauty of formal modeling is that using these ADLs, the rest of the software development process can be automated to some extent. So you can do analysis, evaluation, uh, reuse, automated code generation. So so many different things can be done 
from these ADLs. Not all of these are mature in, in the industry. And, uh, you know, not a, because people uh, develop in so many different languages. And uh, these tools have been developed in very, uh, in with some focus. So if you are, let's say, uh, going to generate, uh, write code in Rust, some of these tools may not have any support for Rust, right? So then you run into some limitations there. But yes, formal modeling actually gives you more power than uh, informal or semi-formal modeling. But having said that, in practice, in the industry, uh, very few people are actually doing formal modeling because it requires a certain level of expertise. There are not that many tools out there and people don't know how to use these tools for various reasons. So what is more prevalent in the industry is informal and to some extent semi-formal. So some architects, they use UML diagrams, uh, but more most common in the industry is just diagrams. It can be Visio diagrams or any kind of SVG documents which people can create. So uh, people communicate uh, their architectural decisions using these informal diagrams. And these are also good because the de developers also can understand these things more easily than you know something like UML or ADL, which very few developers are uh, you know having uh, expertise in uh, interpreting these. Okay, so th this is what uh, mainly I wanted to convey. The process uh, which we already know, requirements come in, and then that translates to uh, architecture. But one of the inputs for architecture is the quality attributes. So, uh, like, what should be the scalability, interoperability, maintainability, CI/CD requirements, observability requirements, and then performance, functional requirements. So those are all the quality requirements expected of the software. And once an architecture is like it has been uh, done, you have to estimate uh, how well these attributes are met by the current architecture. Now, this is not something that is mature. Very few people know how to make this estimate. So the only way which people know is you have to build it and then test it. Then you will get some idea how scalable it is, how maintainable it is, how uh, mature is your CI CD pipeline and so on. So naturally, this leads to the next comment that architecture is iterative. It's an iterative process. It's not that you come up with an architectural model and it is frozen. And uh, once you implement, it's expected to work immediately. So that's not how it works. So everyone knows that the process is iterative. So you can't wait for the perfect architecture. So you get it, uh, you do as much as you can, then start building it. Let uh, developers design it, you implement it, then start testing it. Then you will find certain flaws. So you have to go back and try to re refine the architecture. So that is another reason why architects have to work very closely with developers they have uh, they have to look at the code as well they may not actually do any coding but sometimes they may participate in code reviews look at code give their inputs so mentoring uh, developers is one of the you know important roles that an architect has to do okay they are, so architects and uh, developers they are kind of co-creators yeah, towards uh, any kind of architecture Okay, so that's the process which you know an architect has to take. Now, uh, I, suppose uh, you, uh, somebody has a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I have two questions. Uh, just uh, I heard like something like TOGAF, uh, which is a framework uh, based architecture, which will talk about it's a certification, which yeah, will be yeah. done uh, to high level. Maybe combination of all these architectural uh, application types as well as architectural styles and right. framework. That when do we use that? And um, actually, I'm not familiar uh -huh. with this uh, mm -hmm. framework that you talked about. I heard of it just a few days back. I heard about that. Okay, 
So, so what okay, it contains, uh, as you say, it contains many of these things I discussed, right? Yeah, it's a like, uh, yeah, of course, uh, it has a template, uh, one or two documents I saw, means basics, and it has a template of all the architecture styles. And right. depending upon the combination as well, it will do. My question okay. is, next part question is, uh, which is related to your slide architectural style. Suppose, uh, uh, let's say I have a certain combination of shared as well as distributed and messaging. Yeah, so yeah. in these three combination, is it possible that if I choose, uh, let, let's say, shared memory, you can yeah. open up that uh, architectural style sheet or image which you yeah. have shown. Okay, okay. The so question is, uh, let's say I I use uh, one of them is role based something, uh, uh, and the second one in a distributed I may use uh, shared. Just in right. case, I'm just hypothetically picking up, and yeah, another yeah. one is event driven. I may choose maybe this is yeah. more suitable that that way. So yeah. my question is, uh, in particular combination, just give me one example which will maybe not feasible to have a different combination of what I said or uh, another whichever is feasible. Just give one example which is feasible and one example for non-feasible. Something like that. When we ever okay, choose okay. a couple of, couple of uh, architecture styles. Okay, okay. So uh, I don't know, maybe see many of these things mm -hmm. are like either or client server and peer to peer. They are complete opposites. Right. right? So th that is one comment I can make. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, event driven, asynchronous, pipes and filters. See, I'll give you an example, pipes and filters. Mm -hmm. This is this one is very much similar to event driven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the not similar, not similar. What I mean to say is these two can be combined together into a single architecture, event driven as well as pipes and filters. Okay, that's good. Right, okay. because Pipes and filters, as I showed in another example, where we looked at the architecture of a compiler, data mm -hmm. flows from the left and it goes through many transformations. Mm -hmm. Right? So these transformations are nothing but pipes and filters. This name has come from Unix, where in Unix, you can yeah. pipe the output of one command, it goes to another command. Uh, just, uh, right? that's... So this, uh, this uh, name has come uh, from the world of Unix, pipes and filters. So that okay. is exactly what we saw in the compiler architecture. Each module does something and the data moves along left to right. Uh -huh. So that is nothing but this architectural style, pipes and filters. So one, one part is done, data moves to the next part. Mm, but now yeah, that... this can be integrated with event driven. So mm. how is it integrated with event driven? I will go back to that slide again. Mm -hmm. Where See, the architecture is a combination of both pipes and filters plus event driven. So now what happens in this case? See, uh, without, let's not consider event driven. Text comes in, mm. lexical analysis happens, then the tokens go to syntactic analysis. So there is a straight path, correct? Everything mm -hmm. happens from directly from one module to the next. So this is pipes and filters. But imagine a case where the data doesn't move directly from here to here. Data is stored somewhere else, maybe in memory. And this process is not even running. Okay. So once lexical analysis is completed, this will trigger an event. And let's assume that this is now deployed in AWS Lambda. Based on the trigger of that event, a Lambda instance will be in an instantiated. Then the syntactic analysis will start. So now you can see in this example, it is not only pipes and filters architecture, but it is also event driven because we mm. are using concept of events, AWS Lambda to instantiate these processes as and when required. Right. Yeah, so this, this is an example good. which yeah. combines both yeah, feasible, event driven feasible. as well as pipes and filters. Mm -hmm. This has <laughs> feasible integration, okay. I would like so, to give uh, an example. So it is, uh, anyway, your question is good question. So the shared point is that uh, it is not that example. styles are completely orthogonal. It's possible to combine two or three styles mm -hmm. in the same architectural uh, model. Yeah, 
let's say I'm taking some distributed, uh, I need to th think about memory as well. In that case, which combination is shared and uh, distributed is feasible and not feasible. It yeah, is yeah. possible. <laughs> no, combination, I cannot <laughs> tell you. See, this is where uh, architecture is not a science. It is a little yeah. bit of art. Yeah. So architecture, uh, so not every developer can become an architect because it requires a lot right. of expertise. Exactly. And uh, the recommendation is that architect should have done development for many years. He should know right. the technical constraints, the technical details. Only then he can, he or she can become a successful architect. And the reason it is not an exact science is that many times architects will take decisions but if you ask them why they took a certain decision, they will simply say this is how I have done it and uh, for a long time and this works. A good architect may be able to reason it. He yeah. may give exact reasons, but in some cases. Uh, they rely on their experience. Actually, if you probe them, they will be able to explain. But yeah. if you look at the architectural document, you will not find the reasoning very clearly. Uh, right. Right. So you will yeah, you may think uh, if you are reading the document, you may be wondering why the architecture was designed like this. So in that case, best thing is to talk to the architect personally and then understand by uh, probing him, understand why it was designed like this. OK, another thing, uh, uh, let's say I'm uh, not um, exposed with the space based uh, architecture and uh, shared uh, nothing architecture. Could you please highlight something about that, these two? No, no, see this talk, uh, we are not talking. Uh, actually, this talk is not about how to do the actual process of architecting. That is not the purpose of this talk. Okay. Because I myself don't know what is space-based architecture, shared nothing architecture. I, I have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. I am familiar with client server, Broker, REST, service oriented, event driven, publish, subscribe, pipes and filters, layered, component based, which where we use object oriented concepts, micro kernel, other things I am not familiar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So this talk is, uh, see, each of this can be a separate article in Devopedia. Right. When that archit archit article is published, we can have a separate talk on that. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, I, I but some of these uh, uh, architectures are old architectures. They may not be relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. Space-based architecture, it has been there for many decades. I oh. don't even know whether it is today current uh, in today's requirements. Today, if we talk about cloud native, we talk, uh, I mean, we uh, naturally talk about cloud native, microservices, serverless. Those are the key things when we are talking about cloud-based applications. Right, even okay. service oriented uh, uh, legacy systems are there, but if you have to design something from scratch, people will naturally prefer cloud native today. That is the go to architecture today. I would like to add like few points to the previous yeah. question uh, regarding the combinations you are asking. Yeah, about. yeah. So uh, if you see the types, right? So uh, yeah. Primarily like uh, in an architecture, I have seen like uh, the different types of architecture will be used as combination. So uh, the application I work actually use a client server. Even yeah. uh, component based primarily I can say like that. And okay. Okay. if you are asking about like uh, contradicting or like which won't be used together. So uh, if it is a thing, if you are considering a single type of architecture like messaging, so uh -huh. When the system is very slow, then I I would have preferred asynchronous messaging. Uh, but uh, even the system had to scale more users, then I would go for a public subscribe. Right. And even more increasing, I'll go for an event driven. So okay, this is the okay. way it comes for the contradicting. So a single style of architecture uh, will be contradicting if the architecture style is same for like two different architectures. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that input. Very useful. Yeah. So yeah, I think I we are run out of time. Yeah. So quickly I will wrap up. One minute. Yes, hold one on. minute. I'll wrap up and then we'll come back to Q&A. So those of you who are developers, uh, I don't know, maybe we can have a show of hands. How many developers here who want to become architects or thinking of becoming architects? 
so we have Sai, John. So I think five or six people have raised their hands. So, uh, so there is a career path uh, for, for, from developers to architects, and there are special specializations also. So you can like there are dozens of specializations in this table. I have shown only four: data architect, enterprise architect, solution architect, technical architect. So a data architect, you can imagine. Typically, you know, today uh, some uh, we are uh, many projects are dealing with big data, right? Uh, exa peta petabytes of data, or maybe more. So. And uh, in many of these projects, there are data engineers uh, working on different uh, ways of managing this data. So those data engineers, for them, there is a clear path for their career. They can become data architect. But the problem is how many companies actually have a data architect in place? That's the thing. So whether so, such job opportunities are there, maybe big companies, companies dealing with large amounts of data, data architect is a role that makes sense. Then you have enterprise architect, which is again a career path for any software architect. So uh, whether it's a product company or a services company, big companies, they normally deal with multiple projects. And for every project, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. So an enterprise architect tries to codify things which can be reused. To what extent things can be reused across projects. But uh, here, important point is that uh, whatever enterprise architect does, he is only giving a template. It is the job of the solution architect or a software architect to customize it to, to the exact context of their problem statement. Right? So enterprise architect will give a high level template. Doesn't mean that, you know, of course, as a, you will try to adopt that and follow that as close as possible, but you should also be having the freedom to change a few things if it doesn't meet the context of your project. Right? Because what an enterprise architect does is completely in the world of abstraction. He doesn't have any project specific details because every project is unique. So he does everything in the world of abstraction across the organization. The idea is try to reuse as much as possible for variety of projects. But exact concrete or detailed interactions, that is something which the solution architect or software architect has to do. Technical architect, I don't know. See, some of these terms, you can call it software architect also. Yes. Then, uh, as I said, API architect. So like this, there are different uh, specializations. And uh, yeah, so if you are a developer, first thing is you should move away from your narrow focus. Like today, if you are a developer, you may be looking at a very specific component in the overall system of things. So let's say web application, maybe you are in charge of authentication, authorization, and exact management of different roles, access roles for that product. That is your main, uh, let's say, responsibility. But when you are an architect, you cannot have such a narrow focus. You should be able to look at the big picture, look at the entire system, take a holistic view of the system, not just in terms of functional uh, requirements, but also non-functional requirements. And one of the uh, problems for developers is that when they move to architects, they have this old habit of trying to write code, right? So when you move into the role of an architect, you should not think in terms of code anymore. So that's why this statement is there. They should resist the urge to write code. Because once you start writing code, you go back to the old habit of thinking in terms of developers. And sooner or later, your focus will become narrow to the specific components in which you are writing code. So one of the advice given to developers is, don't write code when you have moved into architect role. Let the developers do it. Right? You can supervise them, you can review their code, but you, you have to enlarge your focus. You are no, not just coding. You are going to be looking at requirements, code, tests, deployments, evolution of the architecture or the product, 
so you have multiple concerns now right so that should be the focus for an architect and uh, yeah you should not lose sight of the quality attributes which we discussed uh, many times here and uh, like i said early on an architect is not just a technical person he comes probably from a technical background most likely from a technical background but then now in the architect's role his concern is beyond technical it's business interpersonal as well right and yeah he should be like a people person because he is going to be talking to all the stakeholders from uh, upper management right up to the developers and testers so and also he may be interacting with customers right so if you are a developer let's say you are a developer who has let's say 2 years of experience this may not be the right time to become an architect but let's say you are pushed into the role of an architect then uh, you try to, it might be the case in a startup right a startup will not have the luxury to have to hire experienced people so you may have just 2 years of experience and they, then you are asked to come up with the architecture so then you have to make the best of the situation and these guidelines will help you make the transition towards uh, architecture okay so those of you who want to learn more uh, there are books on it software engineering institute is the place to go because their concern is uh, really software engineering and architecture is part of software engineering so they have very two uh, two very good books software architecture in practice designing software architectures and then uh, if you want to approach architecture through patterns and styles that we talked about just now there is another book pattern oriented software ar architecture this is again a well uh, uh, well known or well recognized book for 1996 but i think there are like 10 years later i think there is a second edition or a revised version of this so you can look at that as well then there are online courses so se sci itself has offers online courses but there are courses on udemy and coursera as well right so these are the things and uh, some historical context of uh, architecture only one thing i want to mention so i uh, uh, mentioned this in passing earlier so around mid 1990s people st look uh, started standardizing architecture Uh, software architecture so and this resulted in the first standard ieee 1471 which came out in uh, 2000 and then this eventually became uh, so this uh, shortly after that it became a american standard in 2001 and then in 2007 this became a international standard right so then it became a iso 42010 in 2007 it became a iso standard then this standard itself was revised and the new standard is the 2011 standard which incorporates this one plus uh, it brings together some of the other standards which are related to architecture so if you want to look at a particular standard uh, then this is the one to look at iso 42010 standardized in 2011 okay so these are the starting points uh, so like i mentioned uh, this talk is not really to teach you how to select a particular architectural style given a set of constraints this talk is really to give an introduction to what is software architecture how it differs from design what are the inputs what are the outputs and how you can make the transition from you know a developer role towards a architect's role so i hope it was useful any uh, final comments or questions we can take now before we close uh novel is the cloud architecture is there you said the data architect solution architect things like that they are made as another position like cloud uh, architect cloud architect yeah yeah <laughs> yeah how does he come into picture here is so... yeah see it's just another term what they mean is that 
uh, maybe they are expecting a certain set of uh, certifications. He must be certified in AWS, Azure, and he must know all the different modules which are available on the cloud platform. Right, uh, so it is just. Just another term specifically, they have given it a title cloud architect. Maybe he specialized only one cloud, nothing else is that that is the way. Yeah, for that matter, they, they have AWS architect people and such titles are also there. Um, primarily, like uh, you can think of like there are two types of system. Uh, one is like on premise, so that is like uh, you will be having the servers, everything in your office kind of. Another one is cloud. So whatever the architecture we previously discussed, right? If it is happening in cloud, then think of like the person is cloud architect. Inside yeah, the yeah. but uh, see, these are all uh, definitions. Mm -hmm. so according to the context, we can explain all these things. Yeah, I understand your explanation, but I am not too bothered about these definitions. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody may call a person cloud architect. I will call him so a solution architect. Still, I am not wrong. Yes, because it is a more generic term. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, a lot of hands are up. I don't know whether you want to uh, ask question. Sai, go ahead. You were talking about how the role of the architect is sort of to rise above the weeds of coding and deployments and all that and think about the system as a whole. But yeah. then the guidance given by an architect is not necessarily something that the team can use and will be applicable current for the current context. It's not no, no, what is the question. Yes, my question. I'm getting to the question. How do you how does it how is the software architect supposed to be evaluated, reviewed, and judged if their designs, their advice is only marginally or partially useful for the teams who receive their advice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is one of the like unsolved problems of software engineering. So architects comes up with an architecture that uh, developers implement it, but what is the gap between the architecture and the actual code written? There must be a gap. It is uh, no implementation can perfectly adhere to the architecture. So this is an unsolved problem. There is no uh, standard solution how to evaluate the implementation against an architecture. So mostly this is done by reviews. Design reviews and then architect architect will sit with the developers, look at the code, look at the implementation, look at the test cases, and he will make an assessment whether the implementation. Follows as closely as possible to the original architecture. So there is no automated way right now. If there is a formal way, that's what I mentioned earlier. If, arch if the architect has adopted a formal method using ADLs, then there are some tools which will look at the code and then try to map that code to the original ADL. And then it will try to figure out what is the gap between implementation and architecture. But in practice in industry, very few people adopt formal methods of architecture. Mostly it is say, semi formal or informal. So mapping the code to the architecture, that is an unsolved problem or it's done manually through reviews. No, my question was the other way around. Uh, it's, I'm not concerned about the implementation. I'm concerned okay. more about the design. How do you how does uh, the executive team review or the quality of the architect that what they came up with? Ah, so that again, again, that is also an unsolved problem. So that is where evaluation of the architecture itself is an unsolved problem. So for that, as I showed in that uh, flow diagram, uh, the solution there is. Today we don't have a way to do it uh, properly. So the recommended way or the easiest way, let's say, is to actually build it. Right. You have to build that system. See here they say estimate quality attributes. How do you estimate? You have come up with an architecture. How do you estimate the reliability of what you have done, the scalability of what you have done? There are no uh, solid methods to do this estimation. So the recommendation therefore is you can't get the architecture perfect. You have to build it. You have to implement it. Then you test it. Then you will get an idea how 
how scalable it is, how observable it is, is your system. And if these quality attributes are not met, you have to go back. Refine the architecture. That is assuming the architecture is at fault, not the implementation. OK, please go ahead. Next question, Radha Krishnan, or who else is there? Uh, yeah, no, Radha Krishnan, go ahead. After that, uh, we'll close with Saroj. Yeah, very, very quickly, um, one of the things yeah, you did mention, and I think this was very interesting. Uh, at the beginning, you mentioned that software architecture is about making decisions. So I think more than anything else is there. But there's just one thing oh, what struck me was See, when you when you develop a piece of code, like when you build something with a piece of software, then obviously an architect is not just making decisions for himself. The decisions that the architect is going to make is going to impact a larger set of people, right? So um, I suppose um, being a developer also involves making a decision, um, like for example, at a code level or at a unit level or at a, something that he builds for himself. Um, but then. An architect, of course, is again making decisions is the key thing, which is which is which which I found very interesting uh, and relevant. Uh, but then again, the architect, of course, making decisions for a large set, larger set of people. That's uh, one of the things, like a, like a, like a team of people, right? Okay, Designers, okay. Yeah, right, yeah. and not just right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah thanks I, for I will, sharing that, uh, Saroj. Sure, your question. And, 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 uh, yes. So sometimes, uh, as you said, actually, so architects uh, cannot code and uh, uh, they, they should not do the coding and uh, they should do the overall, uh, see the uh, project and they should uh, give the architect. But basically in all the companies, it is not happening, correct? So sometimes uh, they are actually architects also. They are very busy also. They are part of coding and uh, because uh, uh, some companies, they want to do actually the 50 percent coding and sometimes 50 percent they are doing the architect work work so that time the quality of things are not coming properly and maybe uh, i saw sometimes they are doing wrong things so if you are doing they are doing some uh, the architect some some part of the functionality uh, they are doing wrong so how to deal with this uh, scenario yeah so this uh, we cannot blame the company or project team because we are all working under constraint. So it so happens that in a startup, there are only five people. They cannot afford to hire, let's say, a full time architect. What will they do? So the architect is given the task of uh, the writing code also. So uh, yeah, so these kind of constraints are always there in the industry. If you ask me what I can suggest is that Let's say there, let's say there are two projects in the company. In one project, the guy is an architect. In the other, but in that same project, he should not code. He can do the coding for the other project where he is not the architect. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So something like that can be instituted, but again, these are all very much uh, like suggestions only because finally, the resource availability only will determine how we can. Uh, organize things. But uh, fundamentally, the point is that uh, developers, when they move towards architects, they bring with them some old habits as a developer. Oh, yes, and yes. Uh, the, one of the old habit is uh, coding, right? Because that is what they are most comfortable with. They are not comfortable with writing documentation. How many developers write documentation? Even yeah. in the code itself, they will not write uh, documentation to the input output and what uh, the uh, method does. So yeah, right. So developers traditionally are not uh, good in writing documentation. So how will they become a good architect? So they will go back to their old habit of writing code. So then they will not uh, fulfill their real uh, need as an architect. So that is the reason to break those old habits only that we are suggesting. Resist that urge to write code instead. You should develop new habits where you look at the big picture instead. Yes, yes, thank you. OK, uh, Radha Krishnan, last comment. Uh, <clears throat> one, of, 
sorry, last comment. Sorry, without taking too much time, um, one of the things I did observe um, is uh, in my my experiences, um, the, the developers, um, I mean, um, don't really do the unit focus so much on the unit testing. Maybe they don't have time because the time scales that are given to them are like, well, typically in the home to like the treasury business or the banking business is almost like, you know, you need, they, they, I, I think the problem is they have very short of time in terms of the deliverables. And well, let's say if you bring out a code snippet that they have to develop a very simple logic to do a check on, 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 on an amount range or something like that. Well, I guess yeah, anyway, we are running out of time. So I will just some people, some people don't get, some people don't even give them enough time. Like maybe like you have to deliver it. Yeah, yeah, time. I'll uh, conclude so, here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, would you agree that the developers have give, are assigned sometimes time scales where we really have so we have on this forum we have had we have spoken about know. unit testing before. Yes, a developer no, uh, may not give enough importance to unit tests. But right. uh, going forward, it is not such a big problem because now we are entering the world of AI. AI will take care of all these things. This is my personal opinion. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. OK, thanks, thanks for yeah. being part of this session. Uh, this is the last session for this year. I wish you all a